Hi, friends. Susan Blackwell from The Spark File here to let you know that the doors are open for The Spark File Illum, a nine-month group creativity coaching mastermind that invites you to be the chief creative officer and chief marketing officer of your creativity. But what does that mean? That means in nine months in Illum, you will clarify and advance your big creative goals and learn how to effectively share your work with the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you're an experienced creative or an accomplished professional who seeks a space where it is safe to attempt something you've never tried before or complete a big creative project or take your work to the next level and acquire the skills needed to share your creative work with the world, Illum might be right for you. We are calling in emotionally intelligent, high-functioning creatives who are ready to level up. You can find out more by going to thesparkfile.com slash Illum, but do it now to find out if Illum is right for you and to save with early bird discounts. That's thesparkfile.com slash Illum. Take a leap, take a risk. Go to thesparkfile.com slash Illum and join us for Illum. The Sparkfile podcast may contain profanity and other adult content. Please use your discretion. When I bump into something that inspires me, I dump it in my Sparkfile. Sparkfile. It'll be something that I want to make or how I want to be. I pump it in my Sparkfile. Sparkfile. I jump into my Sparkfile. Welcome to The Spark File, your one-stop pod for creative inspiration. I'm Lauren Cammy. And I'm Susan Blackwell. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. You may be asking yourself, what exactly is a Spark File? Where do I get one? What do I file in it? These are good questions, and we have got answers. Yes, we do. A Spark File is a place where you consistently collect all of your inspirations and fascinations. And if you're like us, and you're making shit all the time, you know that sometimes the well of inspiration can run a little dry. We're here to refill it. So we are on the lookout for fresh ideas, images, and inspiration that spark our creativity and pique our curiosity, things that inspire us to get up off of our asses and make things like this podcast. Or a specific universal song that articulates the deepest, darkest parts of yourself. Or an arrangement of Goodbye Yellow Brick Road that fucking haunts my dreams. Or a hit Broadway musical with an all-female leadership team. Or a concert tour peppered with so much delicious profanity. (laughs) (laughs) On today's Maker Sode, we're going to talk to someone who truly sparks us. And that special someone is Sarah Bareilles. Sarah, Sarah, welcome to The The Spark Spark File. File. (laughs) That's how we pronounce it. That's beautiful. (laughs) Thanks. What region is that from? (laughs) Um, So we're going to start with The Spark File price of admission just really quick. Will you please tell us a creative risk you've recently taken, something that scared you, made you shit your pants a little bit, something maybe that wasn't perfect, but was progress? What you got? Mm. I am currently dead center in the middle of something that is not perfect, but in progress that I shit my pants about (laughs) on a regular basis. (laughs) On the regs? On the regs. (laughs) (laughs) Buying new undies, let me tell y'all. Right. Um, No, I have recently embarked on... um, a TV project. Yeah, this is a new, uh, this is a new a, frontiers. A new, a new project for Apple TV um, about a young songwriter. It's called Little Voice. Mm. And um, I'm executive producing and writing all the music for it. Oh and God. it's um, the most intense thing I've ever done. And um, it's currently thrown back into that feeling of like, I have no idea how to do this. It's not so dissimilar to how I felt in the beginning stages of Waitress. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm pairing with Jesse Nelson, who I was my collaborator on Waitress as well. Awesome. So there's some familiar territory and a lot mm-hmm. of unfamiliar territory and just a lot of people carrying heavy equipment everywhere right now. Which is <laughs> just what Are happens. you in filming? Yes, we're You're shooting. In filming. Oh my I God. I couldn't get seen for the central character of the young <laughs> singer songwriter. Much to your we surprise, we did see you. We did see you. It was beautiful. I don't know. <laughs> Can you imagine? We saw you. 
I did not book. Um, I did not book oh, that role. Can, tell me a specific yeah. thing that you're just like, God, this makes me want to shit my pants. Mm-hmm. Well, right now, kind of on a day-to-day basis, we're having to troubleshoot how to make the music talk to the actual filming mm. process. And we're trying to capture a lot of this live, um, knowing that so many of the elements of just shooting in New York make that really That's impossibly really hard. That's really challenging. So, so doing, trying to coordinate and, and collaborate with a certain amount of pre-records and the producer I'm working mm-hmm. with is not in town. And um, so recently, for example, we were shooting in the city and I was sort of like the one on set that was supposed to like know how to do it. <laughs> and I'm like, we like, I don't know how, to, I've never fucking done this. I don't really know how to do this. So I'm just, you know, walking around with my headset on and um, trying to pretend like I know what I'm doing and making decisions. And this fills my heart with love for you. Mm-hmm. Oh God, it shouldn't. I mean, but you know what I do think is that as creators, if you're not willing to sort of not know what you're doing, I don't imagine there's a lot of growth happening. Right. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's really the the times when I look back on my life and I and I feel like I actually took the 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 longest strides forward was the times where I really just did not see the ground beneath my feet for a long time. So we that's talk where I about am now. this uh, this concept a lot. We were and talking about this this morning. This morning, artists and uh, originals, which is a is a, a book that came out a couple of years ago about people who think originally. Um, there's a misperception that they don't feel fear, like and doubt that they have such confidence that they're so sure their idea is going to be genius and it's going to explode. And the exact opposite is true is that, you know, people who are creating and coming up with original ideas, they all feel fear. They all feel, feel a shit ton of doubt and they do it anyway. Yeah. And that's that, on the regs, on the regs, on the regs, <laughs> which is yes. an alternative title for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Just that'll really be your quick. spinoff. I want to just ask one more question about that before we go to our next topic. But do you, how do you handle it? Do you just like throughout the day just think um, it's OK? I just don't know. And that's OK. I'm going to fucking figure this out. Let me tell you what I am learning in real time is that it's not a straight line. Mm-hmm. That I have good days and bad days. On my good days, I can really let things roll off my back. I can make decisions lightly knowing that they may or may not be the right the right ones and mm-hmm. that you do the best you can. Oh God, what are the bad have. days? And what the are bad the days? days are literally like, <laughs> I can't stand the sight of people. I can't, I like, I have to hole up in my office. I'm like clinging oh my to my meditation practice oh to try to God. save me. I like can't have, I'm just a raging bitch. And, um, I just don't, it's just some, and some days are like, all that and the other, like everything yeah. in between. Combined. I'm I'm amazed at how long the days feel right now. It feels like I've gone through like this epic journey. But they by are long out. days. You're not just imagining no. things. These filming days, I'm guessing, are very long days. It's yes. like why why do people do this? <laughs> but why do why do people do eight shows a week? Why I know, do you do right? Shit? Right. I know, and you really do end up having when you get those sweet moments of. I mean, there is something deeply exhilarating about this kind of massive collaboration Mm -hmm. where you're literally looking around at hundreds of people all kind of communing to make this one thing happen and they all have an essential job essential job exactly like chaff that's crazy yeah it's really it's really interesting and um it on the other hand it makes me really crave a a more intimate experience so yeah it's you know yeah it's all of the so things. on your good days you are more flowing and you can and let things roll and on your bad days everybody better watch the fuck out yeah <laughs> or anywhere th- in between <laughs> I think it has to do with like you know accepting that it's just not going to be perfect it's it, mm. it all is going to keep changing in front of your eyes and the thing you thought you were aiming at is not really available and so it's you have to yeah, use what shows this. up yeah. yeah I ran into a little technical thing this week and I was like. I just kept have I kept having to say to myself, there you, this will not always be an impasse. <laughs> Somehow you or somebody is going to fucking figure this out. You have to. Right. Like what you was have, it like a computer problem? It was a ghost in the machine. Oh yeah, out with a sound file of oh. a of an episode that we're like we love. We can't really go back and capture recapture it. We yeah. it, and it's too boring to talk about. But it was dumping the experts, yeah. and for some reason it was it was just so. But I spent like a day being like, 
I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to figure this out. You will figure it out. It will get figured out. Like yeah. somehow this impasse will give way to something else. Yeah. But mm. I, it's weird on those days how much capacity that eats mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I meditate too. And if I didn't, I would lose my goddamn mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sarah, for people who possibly live off the grid or don't know your work, but who are really into but, podcasts. Yes, who are really into podcasts. They're listening to this. Maybe they're in space, but listening now. Um, how do you describe yourself as an artist? Like, what all do you do? Oh, just oh, how do I something? describe yeah. myself as an artist? Hmm. Um, I mean, I always would probably start with songwriter. Feels like the, mm. the sort mm-hmm. of deepest identifying. Those are my identity politics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> songwriter. Songwriter yeah. first. Um uh, and I, and then I think sort of the modes of expression kind of all, um, are, are, are born Morph. from that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's so that's like know, the hub and then things yeah, spoke and out then of that. Things spoke out of that, you know, as a writer or a singer or, mm-hmm. um, a producer of, of any, you know, kind of like the show I'm working on now or the, or waitress as a musical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think a songwriter feels yeah. like the, the, the deepest sort of identity for me. When when did you start thinking of yourself as creative? Do you remember? I was really young when I when I felt like just a profound connection to music. Um, and I my parents split up when I was twelve, and I and my sister I, I'm a lot younger than my sisters, so it's six and nine years older than mm. I. So I did a lot of like roaming the woods by myself <laughs> singing song like making up songs yes. and talking to imaginary oh, I'm so glad you're still alive entertain yourself. <laughs> so glad you're not dead in the ditch <laughs> me too um but oh yeah I, I was very young when I started writing songs when I started singing um and I, I want to just shout out to our uh, <laughs> somebody that helped us with this podcast, our friend Lily <laughs> Clark, who loves you, and she surfaced so much research on you in preparation for this, and she sent us a video of you singing at a f- eighth grade freshman year. It was like a band concert in a gym. Does this oh, ring a bell? Yes, yeah, so that's uh, eighth grade. Eighth, eighth grade. grade, and the thing. You did a beautiful job, but the thing that made me laugh so hard about that fucking video is there's a girl in the band sitting behind you with a saxophone across her lap, and she is just like picking her nails. She could give a shit, and I was like, "The future." Like, I wore a vest for you, bitch. You wore the fuck out of that vest. And she's like, "But when can I play my sax?" But I was just like, I don't even think she was. She was like, "When can I go like get with my football player boyfriend?" Yeah. She she yeah. was interested in picking her nails. Uh, it made really me laugh so funny. hard. And I was like, I bet that's the same girl who's like, I was in eighth grade with Sarah Barella's. <laughs> I, I put money down on that. Um, so you you started feeling like you were creative when you were pretty young. When did you feel like you found your own voice or you were like, mm-hmm. as a, that could be as a songwriter or as a vocalist, I guess. I think being a vocalist sort of arrived first. And I, I think in this sort of oddly distorting kind of way, it was how I felt like I had value as a young, as a young Mm, person. I was, I struggled with weight growing up. I was teased really badly and I went to Catholic school and, and had a really, well, I wouldn't say it was an overall horrible experience. It was a kind of a mixed bag, but it was, but I was teased a lot as a kid. And so had sort of developed really negative self speak and, and (sighs) continue to struggle with that to this day. But I, um, I, being a good singer started to be the the thing that people liked about me. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so I think I developed this kind of distorted relationship with music and, and why it was important in my life. And so the songwriting was something that I was pursuing. And then I had a kind of a traumatic experience where I played a song that I had written in front of my high school class at like a recital or I don't, I don't remember yeah. what it was, talent yeah. show or something. And they didn't, they didn't jive with it. And mm. I've said this story before, but I was listening to a lot of Tori Amos. And <laughs> I think I was really trying to it serve was, us was, some Tori I Amos. I was just really reaching. And it was about a drowning water dancer. And I don't think I even knew what the song was about. And my dear little class didn't get it. And I oh. was mortified. And I sort of went into my hole. Like how I, this, I feel ooh. like this is a, 
what you're talking about here, this really hot moment is yeah. critical. Mm -hmm. How did they let you know that they did not like the song? Lack of applause. Like, not <sighs> they, that they, they didn't. Held, they like, just, it was, it was that, it's undeniable. Like, you know, it. it's just, you just understand when the audience doesn't, it still happens when the audience like doesn't quite you're get it or it. they're yeah. just not, you didn't strike the chord with them. When you said you went into your hole for how long and what did what does that look like from the outside? Like you went, did you stop singing for a while? Uh, did you stop sharing your songs? I stopped sharing songs completely uh, um, for years. And, yes. and then it wasn't until I was 21 and living in Italy when I started sharing songs again. In a foreign, in a wow. so, foreign land. So fucking like, far away from high school. And really, I was just surrounded by my one true love, pizza. Oh, which is, yes. Which is why I finally had the you courage. Felt safe coming out. <laughs> yeah. Also, maybe a language barrier. They wouldn't maybe like, even what they? know. What is she singing about? It sounds good. They're like water dancers. A water dancer. Fine, I love right it. into it. Uh, I would love um, it if you would just bring that song out of the trunk and cover it. Songs are all written by drowning water dancers. So they all stop making sense at some point. I remember it. And what does that mean? It's very morbid. But you know what? <laughs> we love it. Keep going. Yes. I mean, we love I, it. It's the only going. thing I remember. God bless. Water dancers. Um, when you reflect on your life thus far, is there like a line of demarcation at any point, maybe an event or a chapter that you think of your life in terms of like before that event happened and after this event happened? Yeah. Uh, the most recent one that was kind of, the 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 newest reorganizing principle was waitress working on oh, the really? musical waitress yeah i feel like my life actually pretty um the the demarcation is is really pronounced actually like my life as an artist as a person the people who are in my life the kinds of creative projects that have come to me mm -hmm. um my profile as an artist my profile as a sort of just a public persona it's it's mm -hmm. really shifted because of waitress in the way in a way i would never ever ever have are imagined. you into it um yes because it's um the kinds of projects are deeply creative mm -hmm. so it, like i met jj abrams because of waitress and so right. that's why i'm doing a television show right is because with him. of waitress yeah and it's why i met t-bone burnett is because of my relationship who's a for those yeah. of you who don't yeah. know he's a really massive legendary producer um, and he did my last record and I met him because of Waitress, because of my relationship with so Jesse Nelson. Interesting, because yeah. you had so many successful albums prior to that. And then it was Waitress that made that connection. I think there's something about and this is so true of the theatrical community at large, is that there's a really um, legitimizing mm. effect of working in theater. I think it's really it's it's. It's so highly regarded and it, by the intellectual community and yeah. by and even if you're making musicals about pie, it's there, there's something like really <laughs> um, revered about being able to accomplish something in, in theater mm -hmm. in particular. Um, and I have noticed that, yeah, doing this one project in this one location, I mm -hmm. mean, now it's it's in other places as well, but. I was amazed at, at mm -hmm. how many people. There is a legitimacy, I think, especially with Broadway or maybe the West End. Like when we were working on title of show, I remember the number of times I told people like, I had no idea the number of stars that have to align for your show to go to Broadway. It's not just like, oh, we, we booked a theater. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yet it's like there are there are shows in line for every one of those theaters that no one knows, you know, just to to get into one and then for the the alchemy of the show to elicit the response from an audience. Like there's so many yeah. factors that go into it. Completely. Yeah. That's Magic true. must I think be made. For me, it actually was the it landed at a time it reintroduced me to the idea of collaboration on mm. any kind of, you know, Really significant, Real significant yeah. level, and, and it it made me um, just sort of reframe. I felt like I was just starting over again. I felt like that it was so playful and it was so yeah. joyful, and I was like reminded that work can be exciting and fun and feeling like discovery, as opposed yeah. to sort of like the grind and the slog of when you get into those grooves of of what you do. You mm -hmm. seem like a person who is curious and likes to keep 
like climbing mountains, different kinds of mountains, as opposed to being like, I'm a, I, I do a thing and that thing is I'm a singer songwriter and what's getting, what's changing is the venues are getting bigger mm -hmm. or the, you know what, the audience is expanding. You seem like somebody who you like to keep, uh, and now I'm executive producing a TV show. Do you know what I mean? I think that it's, I mean, sometimes I attribute it to the fact that I'm a Sagittarius and the good side of that is that we're, we tend to be, you know, um, wanderers <laughs> and, but the, you know, the bad side of that is that I get bored and I get, yeah. I get, um, anytime something starts to feel too much like a routine, I really reject that yeah. and I feel sort of allergic to it in a way that's like really annoying where it's like, <laughs> but I love this coffee shop. Why are we fucking looking for another coffee shop? Like, and we just like, and I'm like, but we've been there so many yeah. times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. You do so, you do all the aforementioned singer, songwriter, pop star, Broadway star, musical theater, composer, lyricist, TV producer, award show host. I'm sure there's things I'm missing. You strike me as somebody who seems to be in near constant creative flow. Mm -hmm. Is do you feel that way? No. <laughs> <laughs> I have no further questions, Your Honor. You? How does it <laughs> feel to it you? Because like you seem like you are always just like in the flow, in the flow, in the flow. I think that um, I have had a, a really a long run of big projects that have sort of landed one after another in the last maybe five years or so. Okay. Kind of coinciding with my move to New York city. I've been here six years now. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that in a way there's a part of me that's almost wanting to kind of eject from that where sure. it just, I feel like my nervous system needs a break. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, and I think that's part of like, if I were feeling more in the flow of it, it would feel really energizing and rejuvenating. But I think I'm at a stage where I'm tired. <laughs> that makes sense to me. And it yeah. touches on a thing that we're obsessed with, which is what something looks like on the outside and how it actually feels on the inside. I mean, I'm in your house right now. So I actually see, I just I took a really, see. really intense shit in your toilet but we see uh <laughs> most of us most of the time see not like curated but we're seeing like basically your highlight reel yeah. yeah and so of course it makes sense to me that as you've been climbing all these different mountains and doing all these things that are fresh learning experiences for you that your nervous system might be like Yikes. why don't we take it easy for a minute yeah that makes sense to me yeah i think it's important to remember that like I have so I'm so cynical about social media and what's happening mm -hmm. with our life online yeah, just yeah. in general. I mean, it's really generic to be like, I blame social media, but there really is a problem. It's a it's a it's a sickness. It's a disease. Mm -hmm. This idea that there is this other reality that's existing somewhere outside of the room you're actually stand, sitting mm -hmm. in. And and <laughs> I see like it's it's had a totally negative effect on my life the idea that anytime now i don't know if you guys experience this anytime i'm experiencing something wonderful my my knee-jerk reaction without even thinking it is that i have to put it on my phone yeah, I, to, I reach for my phone it. where the yeah. fuck is my phone yeah. and like so, there's this immediate impulse to disengage yeah and because i'm supposed to be putting it somewhere else i've really taken a step back from social media in general um and i can imagine that i'll just continue to kind of like tiptoe out of the room. It just room. doesn't feel yeah. like it's, it just doesn't serve me. I'm going to tangent for just one second. I watched a TED talk yesterday by Joseph Gordon-Levitt and his whole talk was about um, getting attention versus paying attention. Mm. And it was, I was, I was drawn in immediately. I was like, tell me more about that. He was like, as a creative, when I'm paying attention, like when they yell action and I'm, I'm in my scene, I'm paying attention to everyone around me. I feel creatively fulfilled. I feel in the moment, I feel really good. And then when we get out of that and I'm driven by getting attention or when I look at the person that I'm with and I'm like, they have more followers, they're doing more things yeah. there. When I look oh, at them God. as competition for attention, yeah. that's when I stop enjoying my life as a creative. Yeah. And he has a whole thing about social media. That's, that's really fascinating, but I'm the really concept of paying attention 
as a source of of fulfillment Mm -hmm. was spot on. I love that. I love that. The differentiation. I mean, it's so nuanced, but it's like wild. I got to give that some more thought. Yeah, we'll send you. We'll send you a link. We got you. When I bump into something that inspires me, I dump it in my spark files. Could be something that I want to make or how I want to be. I pump it in my spark files. I jump into my spark files. Let's open up the spark files. That was part one of our conversation with Sarah Bareilles. Part two is available now wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, friends. Susan Blackwell from The Spark File here to let you know that the doors are open for The Spark File Illum, a nine-month group creativity coaching mastermind that invites you to be the chief creative officer and chief marketing officer of your creativity. But what does that mean? That means in nine months in Illum, you will clarify and advance your big creative goals and learn how to effectively share your work with the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you're an experienced creative or an accomplished professional who seeks a space where it is safe to attempt something you've never tried before or complete a big creative project or take your work to the next level and acquire the skills needed to share your creative work with the world, Illum might be right for you. We are calling in emotionally intelligent, high-functioning creatives who are ready to level up. You can find out more by going to thesparkfile.com slash Illum, but do it now to find out if Illum is right for you and to save with early bird discounts. That's thesparkfile.com slash Illum. Take a leap, take a risk. Go to thesparkfile.com slash Illum and join us for Illum. Illum.